aerophobia is a type of specific phobia if it gets to that stage. And sorry about the typing error. Phobias are not irrational phobias. Phobias are irrational fears. So fears that we believe that do not have a logical standing, that there is no reason uh, or evidence that we should fear that way, um, and therefore there is no rational support to them. Those are considered phobias. Those are fears that are out of proportion to the trigger, and therefore they require uh, special accommodations or adjustments, such as avoidance behavior, for example, uh, not taking on the flight, missing the flight, if it is in context of uh, aviophobia. But it could be me not um, going in, not taking an elevator and climb the stairs, even if though I have to climb a lot of stairs because I'm afraid of some negative consequences. Uh, that I expect from my experience with the elevator. Um, <clears throat> it could be taking a toll on my physical uh, well-being. It could be taking a toll on my emotional well-being. And it could affect my quality of life because I am not uh, taking the most benefit of the opportunities that I get or the desires that I want to meet. Like, for example, a client of mine um, a few years ago came to me um, and they said that they wanted to visit their homeland and they wanted to take their children to their homeland because they wanted to show them their legacy and their ancestral heritage. And they wanted them to have that experience before they get into the the practical life. So they were doing their high school at the time, I guess. And he said that I can't do that because I am so afraid to take on the flight. And I happen to live near the airport and I keep seeing the planes go by every day, hoping that one day I will be able to shed off my fear and hop onto the flight. And that hasn't happened in years and the time is flying by. I fear that I may not be able to do that in my lifetime. It was very sad uh, and therefore it was very important that we worked through it as well. Um, not all fear of flying is aviophobia because sometimes there is some, uh, some experience um, that has led to that or um, not a lot of accommodations are needed and it is just an unpleasant yet bearable experience for us and we kind of manage it, pass through it, um, which is absolutely okay. But at the same time, that is not the most fulfilling uh, experience then. Usually, whether it is just a fear or it has reached to the stage of a phobia, it would be accompanied by disturbing thoughts. Um, some of those thoughts could be catastrophizing. Like, what if the worst case scenario happens? What if I am not able to receive help that I want to? What if I embarrass myself? What if I am not able to um, breathe or I'm not able to cope with it? What if I have an emergency and they're not able to uh, help me there? These are all disturbing thoughts. Another disturbing thought is, for example, um, it should be a smooth ride if it is safe. A safe ride is a smooth ride. Therefore, if it is not smooth, then it is not safe. It's a disturbing thought again, because that would inculcate fear again. So the feelings that primarily uh, are triggered in that sense. Of course, one is very obviously fear. Um, then it could be a lot of anticipation, apprehension, uh, a lot of suspicion, um, a lot of me blaming myself or the others, uh, like the pilot, for example, uh, or God, uh, 
who put us in that situation for that matter, or um, it could be a feeling of hopelessness and helplessness as well. With regards to sensations, um, very commonly experienced physical sensations would be a change in how you're breathing. It could be very shallow or very deep uh, breathing, um, very heavy, not deep. Deep would be good, but heavy breathing. Um, it could be irregular heartbeat. It could be butterflies in my stomach. It could be tingling or uh, numbing sensation in my extremities sweating, a tightness in my chest or my shoulders or my neck, um, upset stomach, digestive issues. Um, all of these are physical sensations that could happen. Um, accompanying that would be some behaviors. I spoke about the avoidance behaviors a little while ago. Um, that would, mean, that would mean that I would cancel the plans, procrastinate, postpone. Um, I may become very compulsive in my approach, checking things again and again, asking repeated questions, repeating myself. I've done that. I, I know how fear manifests in that. I'll, I'll speak to you about that incident uh, in a while. Um, not being able to make eye contact, um, screaming or um, fainting in, in extreme cases or um, crying, um, holding on very tightly to something, causing pain. And I don't know if in extreme cases, any injury, um, all of that could be the behaviors associated with fear. And of course, if something else is in your experience relevant, you could share, uh, you could always ask uh, to speak. Fear like that is out of conscious control or we believe rather that it is an out of, out, uh, out of conscious control. And quite often, I wouldn't say sometimes, quite often out of proportion. Um, it affects our uh, personal, interpersonal, and social or professional lives. Um, if, it, if it goes to uh, that extent, that extreme, where it needs to be addressed then. And if nothing else, um, it is affecting the quality of life in terms of the choices that we are making. Um, and that is disappointing. I mean, if you are here to live the life to its fullest, why not take advantage of all the opportunities that come your way? And you may choose not to because you just don't prefer that. But if it becomes, I will not do it because I can't do it, that is something that perhaps we could work on. If I do not want to indulge in an experience, it has to be out of choice. Uh, it would be very sad if it is out of fear. And that is why we encourage that we work on it. And likewise, we work on any other fears or um, distress of any sort that we're experiencing in other areas of our lives. Our experience suggests that a lot of times, not always though, a lot of times the aerophobia or aviophobia is not directly the fear of flying per se. It could be things that are associated with flying that we could be afraid of as well, or may just be that, and that is that is what translates into our avoidance experience of, or, or unpleasantness with the experience of flying. Um, I would be interested in seeing a show of hands if there is someone who's experienced uh, a fear of heights at some point in time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, fear of enclosed places, anyone? All right, thank you. I saw your hand as well, Darlene. Um, losing control. Um, fear of uncertainty. Fear of turbulence. Uh, all right, Lorraine, this was uncertainty. Okay, 
All right, turbulence can be really uh, scary at times. Fear of having a panic attack. Anyone afraid of the noises that come from the engine, let's say, or the air conditioning or the smell and sights on the plane of eating something that is not good or something of that sort? Okay, fear of death, illness, injury or helplessness, anyone? Okay, great, thank you. So you see, it may not be directly always the case where you would experience uh, the fear of flying per se, but because we fly, we are at a height and if you're afraid of heights, then that could play out most strongly in the, in the flying situation because we are quite high at that time, not the regular high that we are already afraid of in our day-to-day -day circumstances. It's an enclosed place. Um, you cannot get out of the airplane if you want to, or if you're feeling shortness of breath or other, other physical reactions, um, you cannot just go out and out of and, and put your face out of the window or just leave the plane. You cannot do that for the duration of that you are in the plane. Sometimes the duration is, particularly these days, logistics uh, uh, come in and the duration that you have to uh, spend inside the plane exceeds the anticipated time and that causes a lot of worry. Um, then fear of losing control um, is also uh, somewhat heightened when you are flying because uh, when you're flying, you are not the one who has the command of the ship, uh, the plane, and uh, you are being uh, carried by the pilot. And therefore, um, there is a bit of dependence there. There's a bit of feeling of, I can't control what I want to do. I do not want to get into this turbulence, but I will have to because the pilot decides to. Um, fear of uncertainty. When we don't know, there are a lot of gaps in our knowledge and there are blanks that my mind observes, which it doesn't like. So when we are uncertain about some things, um, the fear kicks in automatically because not knowing could be a threat to my survival. So my brain kind of kicks in information from whatever resources it could access, which is usually my past experiences, um, my observations and my learnings from other people's experiences, my memory, my needs, my desires, my fears, my beliefs and my biases and tries to fill it in so that we don't feel as unsafe but somehow that could also be problematic at times and it could lead to even more apprehension and anxiety like for example um, there is a blank after what if and my mind fills it with the worst case scenario happening that would only aggravate the fear not help us there fear of having a panic attack um if someone has experienced a panic attack, it's a very scary feeling. Most commonly people describe that as the closest to having a heart attack, which is considered very serious and very daunting. So having a panic attack, um, the problem with that is that once a person has ha had it, they start fearing having a panic attack because it was the feeling of dread, um, a lot of loss of control, a lot of uncertainty, and of course, fear of oh, uh, the worst case scenario happening, I'll die. People believe that they will die of this experience. And therefore, it uh, it is a daunting experience in any case. But if you are in a situation like being in a plane uh, at a height, um, at a distance from ground and help, possible help, it becomes even more daunting. And therefore, uh, the, the fears are aggravated. Um, if you don't know how they operate, some people have the fear of the noises coming out of the engine. Um, if you sit beside the wing, those noises are quite pronounced. And uh, may aggravate uh, some kind of anxiety because you may notice the changes 
in the noise levels there, which is primarily the pilot maneuvering uh, his flight or her flight that way. And we will talk about that uh, with our clients usually. We'll explain to them what those sounds and noises are all about. Um, sometimes the noises are coming from um, the chiller, the air conditioning, or um, something happens in the kitchen area, uh, service areas, <coughs> excuse me, that um, may not be uh, a threat it's in itself, but because they are uh, unknown and unfamiliar, they may cause a lot of stress. Um, smell or sights on the plane, some people, um, which I did not mention previously, uh, have a very strong fear of contamination, germs, infections, anything that could be contagious. And uh, planes can be seen as uh, a threat in that, in, that, in that scenario, because of course the seats are shared by people um, if you don't trust the services, you don't know how the hygiene is taken care of, cleaning is taken care of, um, that could be uh, a, cause of, uh, a cause of concern. That means uh, sides, just looking down from the window of the airplane could be daunting for some people. Um, as you leave the ground uh, and you're up in the air, uh, that, has, that has its own perks, but also sometimes threats and fears that may be experienced. Um, and of course, uh, people consider that to be a risky event, some people, and they fear uh, dying or dying in a state where help couldn't reach them or dying in a circumstance where they did not have much control or uh, an illness or injury that could be caused or the helplessness that one would feel in, in any kind of a crisis situation uh, inside the plane. Now, as I said, not all of these fears are irrational. Like for example, uh, fear of catching an infection um, or uh, fear of feeling that uh, lack of control um, makes sense. It, it has evidence to it, but it is, not directly the fear of flying, and it may contribute to the fear of flying. Um, therefore, it needs to be addressed as to what it is that specifically the person is afraid of. The physical sensations that indicate fear may involve, you may or may not have experienced any of these or may have experienced more than one of these, but it could involve chills, choking sensations, Clouded thinking, brain fog, disorientation, flushed skin, blood rushing to the extremities, gastrointestinal upset, we just mentioned that, increased heart rate or irregular heart rate, irritability, uh, startling response, somebody, which is one of the behaviors that I didn't mention. Um, so somebody just bumps into me, just merely brushed my shoulder and I am startled and I can uh, perhaps have a knee-jerk response to it or I may uh, in that response may hit the person because I'm, I'm, I'm just so scared. Nausea, shaking, shortness of breath and sweating and if you've mentioned um, all of these. Mm. Anything that you have experienced that I have not mentioned here in terms of physical sensations that indicate fear that is unique to you? At that if, if you have. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, fear of flying is quite prevalent. Um, the studies done in uh, Europe and USA suggest that between 2.5 to 40% of the population could be affected. The onset, which is the, the age at which the symptoms start to appear, is usually after 25 years. Um, if it is before that, that is uh, perhaps one of those associated fears that is leading to the fear of flying, 
or there's a specific incident, um, even if it is a turbulent flight, that could have left uh, that could have led to it. Um, research has indicated that there are no gender differences found, particularly for flying phobia. However, a phobia is an anxiety response. Anxiety um, could be for it has could have many more manifestations, uh, and that's a topic for another conversation. But anxiety per se is more prevalent among women. Um, so not specifically avu or aerophobia, but anxiety generally uh, is more prevalent among women. So it may perhaps be reported more by women if not experienced any differently. Now, what causes the fear of flying, the aviophobia or the aerophobia to occur? Um, it could be a direct or indirect unpleasant experience. It could be an experience that I have encountered myself or I have heard about. It could be information through mass media. These days, um, there is a trend of having the breaking news. So every uh, other minute or every few minutes, uh, if there is a if there is a mishap that would pop up on the screen, so there is no way I would be missing it if I'm watching the news, for example, and and I may be hearing it uh, more times than I need to, uh, and it is very important to note that every time I become aware of it, like in my conscious, my I, I'm paying attention to it, my body starts responding to it as if it is happening right then. It is very important to recognize, um, I'm a, a mental health professional. I have a strong fascination with mind. Um, it's an amazing entity uh, that makes us very unique uh, as a species. At the same time, I'm very um, frustrated with the mind as well for a couple of reasons. Um, one of the reasons that is relevant right now is that the mind does not have the distinction between imagination or reality, and body responds to the mind. So whenever a thought comes into my consciousness, my body reacts to it as if it is happening right then. I could be thinking about apes 10,000 years ago, uh, roaming around this, this piece of land, for example, if that was possible, I don't know, 10,000 years how, how old is the ice age and all? I'm very bad with that. But um, but I can create that in my memory. Even if it wasn't an ape age, the accurate thing, I can imagine 10,000 years ago, it is only apes on this planet. And my if I am afraid of apes or monkeys and all, or I'm excited about it, my body will start responding to it by secreting hormones, glands, by uh, pumping blood into my bloodstream, uh, the heart working diligently, my lungs working uh, more to, to, to create that, to create that preparedness for me to deal with the situation that I have just become aware of. I'm mentioning this because I have a problem with this breaking news phenomenon, the, the news flashing every few minutes is because my body responds to whenever I'm paying attention to it, I don't pay attention to the, the strip, new strip, every time it comes uh, on the screen. But when I do, my body starts responding to it all together um, as if that was the experience that had occurred right then. So it's like repeatedly my body is preparing to fight it or run away from it or going into the freeze mode or looking for support. Um, as if it is happening to me repeatedly. And that takes a toll on my well-being that way. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Hypervigilance, it could be just my trait uh, because I'm an, an anxious person. So I am more vigilant about something going wrong. And if I am paying attention to only what is going wrong, I will find something wrong. If you start... Noticing your heartbeat, we mostly don't. But if you do, then you say, oh, I missed a heartbeat here. Because you will naturally miss heartbeats here and there. You do get an average of 72 to uh, some, some figure there per minute heartbeats. But it's an average and it's a range because it is not 72 every minute. 
it is somewhat in that range only. But if I am hypervigilant, if I am paying attention to it, then I may be apprehensive about, oh, why did I miss the heartbeat, for example. So anything that is different, unusual, out of the norm, or is unexpected might grab my attention in a threatening manner. Um, this, as I said, that not all fear is irrational. You do experience certain physical sensations during the takeoff and landing. Um, the body, of course, is responding to gravity uh, as the plane fights gravity, uh, both at the time of landing and takeoff. Excuse me. And the body needs to adjust to it. And therefore, we will experience some sensations there. Ears popping, sometimes butterflies in my stomach, um, sometimes nausea. Different people have different sensations there. Some people just don't feel anything at all. Um, but it is possible. Um, lack of knowledge or experience. I may think of, for example, turbulence as the killer, whereas the research suggests that that is not. Um, it's a very natural occurrence. And uh, the planes are designed, for example, to be safe during the turbulence. Um, underlying anxiety or depressive tendency could make me minimize the positive impact or situations uh, in all of these uh, contexts, and therefore flying also could become just another mundane or even negative experience for me. Other fears that we have talked about the, uh, before in the previous slide, nervousness or lack of confidence, which also contributes to my feeling of out of control or helplessness and may contribute to uh, phobia that way. Um, how do we manage aviophobia or aerophobia or fear of flying? Number one, understand your triggers. Know, because we've talked about as to it could be so many different things there. Know what is it that, uh, that initiates that response, in the fear response in you. Identify what is your habitual fear reaction and what is your desired response to it? How would you want to uh, behave in the presence of that trigger? Now, trigger could be the height, for example, and the, because the plane has taken off and is now cruising. Um, now, triggers are not avoidable at all uh, uh, in all situations and in all circumstances. How I respond to them can be managed and therefore understand whether you have the fight, the flight, the freeze, or the phone reactions, we have the other as well these days. And what is your preference? And what is most helpful for you in that? And your uh, self-exploration and or with the guidance of a counselor or therapist, you could work with that. And then recognize your choices in those situations. So becoming intentional in those situations, in the presence of those triggers, rather than be reactive and having those knee-jerk responses is going to help. Sometimes what is happening automatically could be a positive response. And if you can just do that intentionally, um, you can see the benefits of it. For example, if I am having an irregular breathing, if I can learn how to initiate an irregular breathing myself, I can also recognize, okay, how can I regularize it? And that could help me becoming more intentional when I'm in that situation and I notice that the breathing tends to get irregular, I may be able to manage it more. So some of the things that you could do before the flight is um, get some knowledge, get some exposure, understand the flight dynamics. How does the plane operate? What happens when this takes off? What happens when it plans, what happens during the cruise, what to expect, um, why do they keep the certain altitude, what is turbulence and what are the risks associated with the turbulence. So some of the common experiences that we experience during flying, now there is a lot of information available. Um, use the credible sources as much as you can. Talk to somebody who's an expert um, or a professional and know a bit more. Understand your bodily reactions. What are your go-to responses? What are your strengths? How does your body respond in a happy situation? And how can you create that experience for yourself? 
one thing that helps um, in my clinical experience a lot, and we use that as a strategy, is labeling my emotions or feeling. What am I really feeling? Is it all fear, though? Is it fear and something else as well? Um, do I want to avoid the flight because I am avoiding something else as well with that? Uh, is the is the uh, fear accompanied with sadness or hopelessness or helplessness? And does that, uh, can that change? Um, exposure is a very good strategy to overcome some of these uh, reactions and manage them. So expose yourself to triggers in control settings. Um, I was told a lot to do couch flying. So when I'm not flying, uh, use the maneuvers, uh, use gestures, the, What? how are you using controls? Imagine, and as I said, um, they were not psychologists, they were not trained in that, but they knew that my brain, if it can create that picture, my body will start responding to it. And believe me, it does. So expose yourself to triggers and control settings, um, I just mentioned about breathing, try and do some rapid breathing, some shallow breathing, some deep breathing to know the difference yourself. And you can perhaps control it and regularize it that way. Anticipate triggers. If there is, if you're going on a flight, anticipate turbulence. Anticipate that there may be delays. Anticipate that, um, that there might be pain, for example. Uh, when then the plane is taking off or landing, mostly landing. And with anticipation, plan your responses. So if that happens, what is it that I can do there? Planning definitely helps. Um, planning may also involve as to how you'll approach the airport, because a lot of times the fear is not just about the plane, but it is a lot about things that happen before you get onto the flight. Like, for example, these days, it's it's a pain in the neck to have those long cues that you have to stand in. And uh, it's physically taxing, it's mentally taxing. And somebody who is already nervous and feeling apprehensive, um, this could lead to a lot of anticipation anxiety, particularly when you have gone through the uh, security and now uh, now waiting to board the plane and in that in that little chamber, that, that, that connects the plane to the airport, um, it can be very stuffed also sometimes. Take your time and go slow. I usually suggest that if you can be mindful, your pace will automatically slow down. So try and identify that uh, space for you where you can be mindful of your thoughts, of your emotions, of your bodily reactions, and pace it according to what is whatever is your capacity to take. I'm very mindful of the time. And we just have a couple more slides. So hopefully you should be able to do it. During the flight, find your comfort. For example, for logistic reasons, um, I would always be the last one to get up. I will not stand in the queue for a long time. I'll just see okay whether he was going and I will take my time to just go at the end. Um, I do not try to be the first one. A lot of people feel comfort in that though. So if you feel that that's what makes you comfortable, so get, your, get in your queue early so that you can settle down in the plane uh, without a lot of uh, cramming and jamming uh, uh, in the queue. And then you can be in your spot and perhaps you could do your breathing exercises, your meditation, or read a book. Um, if I could do that, I would do so to sleep. Identify the catastrophic thoughts. Catastrophic thoughts would be like we said, the worst case scenario that would come in and reframe them. What's the possibility of that happening? What else could happen? And what is the probability of that? Is the probability divided amongst all the worst case scenarios? Could there be good scenarios also? And do they have some probability and possibility? Like one of the questions that I usually encourage my clients to ask is, what if the worst case scenario does not happen? What would that be like for you? Could you imagine that? Could you engage your body and your mind in those thoughts? So that would be some reframing. 
pace when you can. If it's a long flight, leave your seat and not during the turbulence, of course, but otherwise, just walk a little. Um, you can stretch your body. You can find that those exercises and movement can really help settling down some of those sensations that you're experiencing. Keep yourself hydrated. A lot of times the panic is a result of the irregular breathing and the heart rate just because of dehydration and use distractions without any judgment. I think should have pointed that out here. It's okay to read a book or watch a movie or listen to a, listen to a TED talk or music, whatever works for you. To, um, talking to your uh, compa travel companion, looking out of the window. Um, do all of that so that you're not hypervigilant and you're not focusing on what is going wrong or what could go wrong there. And after the flight, congratulations. You have made it. Every flight that you have undertaken is a success. Recognize that. Remind yourself of that before the next moment where you have when you're anticipating flying. Well, that went all right. Then I can be more hopeful that this will be all right as well. Appreciate your effort. It's difficult to experience and stay with your unpleasant experience, uh, unpleasant emotions. And fear is an unpleasant emotion for sure. It requires courage in order to embrace that and sit with that. Courage is not eliminating fear. Courage is embracing your fear and you've been really courageous. And in, on that note, also note what worked for you the best so that that would be yet a useful resource for you for the next flight. Celebrate and repeat, never stop yourself just because you feel afraid or something did not go as per expectations. There is a lot of help available for you. Uh, there are CBT programs, cognitive behavioral therapy programs, individual programs, group programs, structured programs, uh, hybrid programs, um, contextualized programs which incorporate CBT and other therapeutic modalities for anxiety in general and for fear of flying in specifically. Um, it is very interesting that we have these discovery flights here. I see a lot of flight schools offer them. Um, whenever you can, give yourself a treat uh, and try and experience that. It will give you a very hands-on experience of flying. They let you maneuver the plane also a bit. And they explained to you a lot of these flight dynamics that could be very helpful for you to fill in those gaps with accurate knowledge rather than your own uh, biases or incomplete information. Um, if you want exposure in a control setting, there are flight simulators. Um, people play with them all the time. There is VR exposure that is available. Um, experience that and see what happens when you, when you are close to reality and not yet there and in your safe zone. And last but not the least, if there is an experience that is uncomfortable, growth is inevitable. Growth and discomfort are mutually inclusive. So if you're having a difficult experience with flying, ask yourself this question, what's in it for me? See if you can identify that and that could reframe the entire experience for you. Well, that's from my side. I understand that uh, we would have some questions or comments. Um, I open it up for you. Any comments or questions are most welcome. So I can stop sharing now, perhaps. <laughs>